Welcome back. With the CPU completed, it's time to see how the system actually gets its program code and data. The NES uses cartridges, which are essentially circuit boards that plug into the main NES system. These circuits are hidden inside plastic cases, so unless you peek inside, it's easy to miss. Let's look inside the cartridge for the NES game Pinball. Here's a picture. On the bottom, we can see what is sometimes called gold fingers. These are metal contacts that allow two circuits to be combined just by pressing them together. This is where the cartridge would plug into the main system. In the middle of the cartridge, we can see two main chips. Most of the markings on the chips are the same, but on the top line, we can see that one ends with PRG and the other ends with CHR. These two chips store the program and character ROM, respectively. ROM, R-O-M, stands for read-only memory. These are a lot like the main memory of the system, except that they ignore any attempts to write to them. These chips are sort of written to, or programmed, only once during manufacturing. Just like main memory, values can be read by specifying an address, which will allow us to read a value from the chip at a particular position. Program ROM stores the machine code for the 6502 program. These are the same sort of bytes we saw when we looked at an assembly language and the machine code that corresponds with it. Character ROM stores graphic data in the form of tiles. We'll see this in more detail when we look at the graphics chip. In the upper right hand of the board, we can see it is marked with NES NROM 12803. This tells us what type of circuit board this is. Many games for the NES used similar cartridge hardware, only replacing the data stored on the ROM chips. Different cartridges can change how the gold fingers connect to the chips holding the game data. Some cartridges even have sophisticated behavior outside of just providing the data stored in these chips. But we'll start by understanding the most simple case. The simplest cartridge hardware is the NROM that we have here. An NROM cartridge simply makes the character ROM available starting at a certain memory address, and the character ROM available at another. How does this work? Let's take a look at the pinout for the NES cartridge. This tells us the significance of each of the pins, or gold fingers, that we saw earlier. There's a lot here, and not all of it matters yet. I want to emphasize, though, the pins labeled CPU A, followed by a number, and CPU D, followed by a number. These are the address and data pins, just like the pins the CPU uses when talking to standard memory, or RAM. The address pins, 0 through 15, are the 16 pins that get set to the respective bits of an address. The eight data pins, D0 through D7, are how the respective device can respond, or this is how the CPU specifies the value that it wants to write. In the era of the NES, memory was almost the same speed as the CPU. So rather than invent an extra protocol for devices to communicate, they basically all behaved as a special form of memory. Cartridges expose program ROM to the CPU, and the character ROM to the graphics chip, aka PPU. The PPU A, followed by number, and PPU D, plus a number, pins, work just like the CPU pins. The difference, though, is that they are connected to the graphics chip instead of the CPU. How does the cartridge know when the CPU wants to talk to ROM? This brings us to what is known as the memory map. The Memory map describes which addresses in sort of a complete view of system memory correspond to which devices. If multiple devices tried to respond when the CPU specified a particular address, it could result in either the CPU reading corrupt information or crashing the system. So the designers of the NES system created a memory map, which sort of divides up the entire range of memory into chunks that each device is responsible for. The assignment of devices to regions of memory is called mapping, and the resulting arrangement is called the memory map. Here is a snippet of the memory map for the NES. I will include a link to a more complete version of this in the video description. For now, I just want to highlight a few entries. The very first range from 0 to 07FF hex is about 2K of memory. This corresponds to the built-in system memory, or RAM. And towards the end of the memory map, from hex 4020 to hex FFFF, is about 49k 
and this is free for the cartridge to do whatever it wants. This first segment is just standard system memory. This memory map applies to all cartridges. Different games and cartridge hardware may choose to use that region differently. Let's see what NROM does. Just like before, I'll link a more complete version of this memory map, but I just want to look at two pieces for now. From address hex 8000 to hex BFFF, this corresponds to the first 16K of the program ROM. Then, from hex C000 to the end, hex FFFF is another 16K region. It will either be a repeat of the first 16K of ROM, in the case where the ROM is only 16K. In the case of a 32K ROM, this will be the second block of 16K. And we won't worry about how character ROM is mapped for now. And that's it for this very simple form of cartridge hardware. Now that we've seen what a simple cartridge does, we can start trying to emulate its hardware. But first, we'll need some data to emulate. Fortunately, the Nest Test homebrew ROM that we saw earlier for testing the CPU actually emulates an NROM cartridge. But in order to find the program ROM data within this cartridge file, we first need to parse the NES file format. We'll take a look at loading the cartridge file next time, and then we'll be ready to start taking a look at graphics. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you on the next one.